So, hello everyone. Thanks for that awesome music. Uh, I'm supposed to talk a little bit about stuff I've been doing ages ago and, and today. Uh, so my name is Peter, and some of you might remember me from having a big, huge whale that I was carrying around to all of the demo scene parties back in the day. Um, I'm, I started a demo group in Sweden called Craze, which you also might remember. For we were, all, we were always drunk when we were at all of these parties, and uh, we had a lot of crazy people that did not so good demos, but they were always funny. And basically that's the thing I've always been interested in, in doing funny things rather than good things. Um, I also was a member of uh, TriStar Red Sector. I probably am still a member. I, we already had this discussion today that I met a guy who said he was a member of Craze, and someone said, oh, still? And, and you never actually leave your groups after 2000-something, because we just stayed in them. And even though you know, they just faded, the memory is still there. We're still old. So I was a member of uh, TRSI, and actually I started with the demo scene, as many of you probably using this software, which is from the group that I later joined, which is Red Sector uh, Demo Maker. Have anyone used it? Okay. Anyone released a demo used, you know, using this? Only one person. Two people. Of course, DJ Cat would say that because he's probably the one who could do that. Um, so, TRSI was really awesome to be part of, even though I was a little bit different than most of the other guys in TRSI. One of the funniest stories is probably that, uh, first of all, I was a bit younger than most of the other guys. Not a lot of people in Scandinavia were members of TRSI. It was mostly people from Germany or, or, or uh, Austria and so on. Um, a lot of weird people. I remember I was in uh, the party in Denmark in 1993. I was, yeah. I just turned 15. I managed to convince my mother to let me go uh, all the way to Denmark for a few few days. And that was very, very early. And I got to the party and TRSI was one of the big groups there. Everyone treated us really, really great. Um, and the organizers were really scared of kicking us out. So people in TRSI were doing really weird stuff, especially for a 15-year-old from a little city in, in, in Sweden. Uh, I was the only one who didn't bring a spoon. And the reason for having a spoon is that you can take your cocaine or heroin and put it on top of the spoon and then you can fire something up underneath to make sure that it's good quality drugs before you inject that. So I was sitting there 15 years old trying to do demos and helping with the release that we had going um, and I was the only one who was not high on something you injected at the party because that's how scared people were of TRSI. I did not fit in, but I, then again, whatever. Uh, I've met worse people in my life later on. Um, TRSI was uh, very special for me in many ways. Uh, one of the funniest things is that I actually joined TRSI Records um, because we decided that we were going to release some of the, uh, the music from the Amiga scene. Um, uh, I actually won assembly in 1994, 95, the music competition with a song that I apparently made. Actually, it was someone in Morrow made a song and told me, please enter the competition because we can't actually be there. So here, go win for us. So I've never made music, but I'm still the winner of assembly, uh, which is how we did everything in the demo scene. We just lied and faked it, whatever. It was awesome. Uh, TRSI, we started this TRSI and Fairlight Records. Uh, and that way I also joined Fairlight because I met some of the people. So I was in both of these groups, which was uh, quite a big thing. Uh, especially for me when I was really young. The, the funniest thing about TRSI Records is that I later started working quite a lot with the record industry or maybe against the record industry, um, which I'm also going to talk a little bit about. Um, the idea with TRSI Records was that we wanted to go a little bit more mainstream and invite people more and more into um, the computer scene and make sure that people understood how awesome the music was, how good the graphics was, all of these things. and. We didn't make that happen, but I, I think as uh, also Jimmy talked about before, is quite a lot of people from the scene has been really successful in pushing graphics and music. And of course, all of the, the, the gaming companies that come out of the demo scene is the people that really run the world today in, in that retrospect. For me, one of the biggest things I learned from, uh, from the scene is that everyone just copied things, because that's the way I learned everything. 
Um, so if you had a, like the, my first uh, C compiler was, uh, I think, Lattice C that I copied on six, seven floppy drives. Uh, and, and just, we'd never talked about copyright as an issue. And uh, this is the way I learned everything. Like everything I work with today is still based on the fact that I copied a lot of things. And later when I, I, was, I was running a BBS and people uploaded, downloaded things all the time, I had all of the new stuff and I, I just learned quite a lot. I learned to speak English, I, I improved my Finnish, which was not hard to improve, um, and all of these things. And it came out of me illegally doing things. So uh, when we kind of went from B the BBS time into the internet era, I, I can also brag a little bit, I had the first BBS in uh, the Nordics on Telnet, uh, which no one cares about, of course, but it was important to me at that time. Uh, but when we moved over to the internet, w th there was this discussion about who owns information. And for me, that was a really strange thing coming from a, a background where we never talked about that, because, of course, information, it was not this stupid information wants to be free thing. It was more like information is free, why are we even talking about it? So I, I joined later a group uh, here in Sweden called uh, Pirotbyron, uh, which some of you might remember. Uh, so the Bureau for Piracy. Uh, it was a lot of people, some people from the demo scene was also part of this, but mostly was hackers, academics, musicians, artists, and other people that had this joint idea that we wanted to make sure that the internet is a safe place for everyone and that we can learn everything and we can do whatever we want on our premises rather than turning it into a cable TV kind of thing. Um, and the, I, the first thing we did is that we took the name Piratbyrån from the Swedish group anti Piratbyrån. So we wanted to show them that if we copy something and we remix it a bit by taking away something which is bad, the anti, we make it better. The funniest thing is that everyone after that thought that we were actually the original deal. So that anti Piratbyrån was a group founded to fight us, which is an awesome rewriting of history. So just, it just proved our point. We made something better by copying them and, and making it good. Uh, and we've always been doing all of these games in the groups that I work with or, or, or deal with. It's always about gaming things and, and playing with people's prejudices and so on. So another thing that, uh, that we started was uh, the Pirate Bay, uh, which was also quite a, a big deal for a lot of people. And for me, this was a, a natural step. It was just another BBS, which had a much faster way and much easier way for people to share files than, than uh, just on a BBS. You're not really limited to phone lines that cost like 300 kronos per month to, to run. It would be really weird if we still had that in order to download something. Um, but the Pirate Bay was for us not very much about the technology, but it was much more about getting people to share files with each other. And we started this as a Scandinavian file sharing system. So everything was in Swedish. Uh, we had only Swedish people uploading and downloading things and posting comments in Swedish in, in, the, in the forums and so on. And it was just like a BBS, but just on the internet. Um, until it started becoming really important to people. So what happened is that um, people realized that Pirate Bay was one of the few sites left doing file sharing in the end. Um, so we became a bigger than, than we were ever supposed to be. So just to make sure that you understand how small Pirate Bay was, uh, this is the first service that we were running Pirate Bay on. It's actually the, the one in the shoebox here, because we didn't have money to actually buy the whole machine. We could only afford the motherboard. Uh, so we had a shoebox to put the machine in. Uh, the other service was like borrowed shitty stuff, like Pentium stuff. And at this time, I think when this picture was taken, Pirate was responsible for about 10% of the internet traffic in the world. And this is the amount of stuff. Yeah. And the funniest thing is like, uh, I remember we, we became much bigger later on and um, there was, uh, we're going to talk about that later, but there was a raid against the Pirate Bay and uh, internet traffic dropped. And at that time, over half of the internet traffic on the internet just vanished because there was no one around. Um, but the funniest thing, um, so we were three people in, in Pirate Bay. It was me, Frederick and Gottfried. And uh, I remember one time when Gottfried was drunk or high in the data center and he tripped over the blue cable here and it broke. And it was... 10% of the internet vanished. And I remember <laughs> at the same time reading a newspaper article from Cisco trying to explain how to get the last 0.1% of uptime on the internet stuff and how expensive it is. And I'm thinking, well, you can start with giving Gottfried like drug treatment or alcohol <laughs> treatment, much cheaper than the other stuff you're doing. So, of course, what happened is that uh, 
everyone else started getting these letters to so were running file sharing systems. Um, um, and this is something called a cease and desist declaration. So basically a company that doesn't like people file sharing whatever they've made or whatever they claim that they have the right for, they send out the letter telling you that you're not allowed to let people share this information and uh, they wanted us to sign an agreement and so on. Um, and when you get these letters, the, the, a lot of the people running file sharing systems were similar to people running BBSs back in the day. It was 14, 15, 16 year old guys uh, doing it for fun and for the importance that they didn't really understand yet, but it, it was really important for a lot of people. Um, so when you get a document from a lawyer and you know that just a lawyer takes you know, 200 euros per hour to write something up and this takes five hours to write, uh, you feel a little bit scared. So most people decided like they will follow, it's not about the legality, it's about being threatened. So they closed down their websites uh, uh, and in the end it was only Pirate Bay left. So Pirate Bay was never good. It was always fun, but it most importantly was al always stubborn. That was the whole thing. So when we started getting these letters, uh, because we were the last guys on the block basically, uh, we decided that instead of agreeing with these letters, we're going to respond to them and we're going to publish why we don't agree with these letters. Um, this is my favorite one. We published all of them on Pirate Bay. They're not there anymore because the current use, uh, you know, people who run Pirate Bay are stupid. Um, <laughs> but this letter was uh, from a, a German company um, that wanted us to pay them 25,000 euros in damages for allowing people to download fonts. And they own, for instance, Helvetica and some other big famous fonts and they really upset about this. So they had a list of fonts that we were, we had to make sure that these could not be downloaded using Pirate Bay and otherwise we had to do all of this. So we decided, let's uh, do what we always do, let's copy and remix. So we made a, a, a cease and desist declaration that we sent back. Based on the same wording, we remixed like, you need to stop sending us stupid letters, you need to pay us 25,000 euros. And of course, to be us, we used all of the fonts they complained about. And this is the, the funny thing, it's like an, a lawyer is not used to getting a response like that. So they don't know what to respond, so they stopped sending letters after that. And, and, <laughs> it, you know. and we, we always did all of these things that we, we played with their prejudices. So uh, one of my favorite letters that we got was from DreamWorks. Uh, we sent, you know, they were complaining about uh, us violating some local state law in a state in the United States. And we just sent a world map showing here is the US, here is Sweden, there's some water in between, you need to invade us like you usually do with other countries before you can dictate what we're doing. Um, we didn't get a response. Another time we got, I think it was from Apple, we got a, a letter, uh, I sent back a picture of a polar bear. Just a picture. And they replied, what is this? And I replied, well, it's the guy standing outside my home trying to kill me. I live in Scandinavia. We have other problems than you have. Copyright is not an issue if you have this guy outside of your window. Um, <laughs> and essentially, the guy was like, okay. And then he stopped sending letters. So, you know, they, they didn't pursue that. So, in the, you know, they started doing other things. Um, one of the most, like, Typical things we would do is always you know, play with, with ideas. And a good thing to do when you have a lot of people that hate you, like Hollywood, uh, is that you find the people that hate Hollywood or uh, hate the country they come from, like North Korea, and you say that you work together. Um, so actually, twice we've said that we were hosted in North Korea, just as a joke, uh, both times. And every time media believed us, uh, which is really amazing. First time it was really stupid because it was on the uh, last of March we released the news that we were hosted in the North Korean embassy in Stockholm. Because Sweden actually has one of the few countries in the world that have a, an, an embassy for North Korea. Uh, it was always based on the idea that North Korea have one thing they say to every journalist asking about whatever, and that is, I can't comment on that, or no comment. Which for any journalist means there's something to this. So we were waiting for them to realize it's a 1st of April prank and they sent out this, uh, some journalists calling, you know, I think it was Doggins Nyheter that tried to find out this, the truth of the story. And they, you know, wrote a newspaper article with the comments from the North Korean ambassador saying like, we cannot comment on this, which means there's something to this. It was really funny. <laughs> Second time, we took this a little bit further, also on the last of March, because in some time zone it is the 1st of April. Um, so we had some out of this, but we actually stole all of the IP space for North Korea because it was super simple for us to do. We just 
uh, we all work in uh, networks and technology, so we just wanted to show off that we can actually steal some IP addresses using some bugs in the routing system. So for one week, we had all of the North Korean IP space, and we put PyPay on one of the IPs that belonged to the North Korean government. Um, <laughs> And not only that, we also faked the whole trace route. So if you looked at how the traffic passed, we made some jumps in between. We put some routers up with some delays. So it looked like it actually passed through a satellite or, or something like that. Uh, so we delayed all the packets. And people were not sure how the fuck did we do this. Uh, and we did it at the multiple points. So it looked really, really weird. And uh, it looked super real. And every, every time someone you know, asked the North Korean people or the, the embassy for a comment, they could only say, well, we can't really comment on that. The bad thing about stealing the North Korean IP space is, of course, that the people of North Korea couldn't use the internet for the whole time we <laughs> took it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So, it's always been really fun to play with all of these things. And, uh, and for us, when like, the industry call started calling us pirates, we all pirated back in the day, so we, I don't think any one of us would care. And, but we were kind of inspired by the, the gay movement. So when people call you gay or queer or whatever, then you take the name back and you make it into something you know, that you, you own and you just reclaim the name. Um, so this thing with pirates, calling us pirates, it didn't really take off. It wasn't really negative to call us pirates. We already did it ourselves. And also Hollywood, like it's really stupid to say that pirates are bad and then make a franchise about pirates in Caribbean, you know, to make pirates cool as well. Uh, I didn't know how they were thinking about that. But a really funny thing that happened, which is one of my typical things, I'm going to go in a little bit more, uh, that I, I work with now, is that um, the council, the, the woman that worked uh, for Hollywood, she started using another thing to call us. And I'm going to see if the sound works here. Hopefully it does. Till börja med så tror jag inte på att det skulle finnas någon form av av idé hos vanliga ungdomar om att upphovsrätt skulle vara fel eller så. Det, 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 det tror jag är en myt och den har, den har liksom de här, den här kopimistsekten varit väldigt duktiga på att marknadsföra. So it was kind of funny this, uh, this woman Monique Wadstad, she's the Hollywood representative in Europe. Um, and she realized it doesn't work calling us pirates, so she was in interviews trying to call us a cult. Every time she talked to the media, it's like, this cult, this cult, no one cares about this cult, and to minimize what we're doing. And for me, it was kind of interesting that this woman uh, was referring to us as a cult, because she has two clients. She has, she's a representative in Europe for Hollywood, and she's the European representative for the Church of Scientology. <laughs> so I was thinking, okay, uh, she should know what a cult is, you know. Maybe she doesn't really care, but it, and, but she realized that working with that, it was really negative to be called a cult. Uh, but what do you do when people call you shit like that? You do this. This is wild. Some people seem uh, to worship technology, but now it's being recognized as a religion. Yes, in Sweden, a church whose central tenet is the right to file share has been formally recognized by the Swedish government. It's called the Church of Copy Meism, uh, I guess, Copy Meism or Copy Mism. Okay, and it claims that copy acting, sharing information through copying, is akin to a religious service. So. Just so you know, 500 krona so you can start your own church. Uh, it's, it's really simple in this country. Uh, it was really fun because I realized a really funny thing when researching how to make your own cult that um, Sweden has a good law for it. It just you know, split with the state church and made this super liberal law about whatever you believe in as long as you have some sort of a Bible and some sort of prayer, that's fine. And I was sitting up really late one night and I was thinking about this and I realized when reading the law that you remember the FRA law, and you remember IPRED directive maybe. All of these monitoring and the data retention, all the monitoring storage of your information, they have one exception. You're not allowed to listen or store religious communication. So when you talk to your priest online, it cannot be used by the FRA or anyone else. They cannot listen to that, they cannot store that. Uh, and I thought it was kind of funny that there was a religious exception to this. So I, I have some experience growing up in Norway, but, you know, religious fanatics, and I lear had to learn about religion in Norway. Um, and I remember that the Mormon church consider everyone being a priest. So there's already a precedent for everyone being a priest. So I was thinking, what can we do with this? So I decided, like, hmm, 
let, let's make sure that everyone file sharing is considered a priest. That would be funny. And then instead of peer-to-peer, -peer, P2P, we could have priest-to-priest -priest communication. Uh, and I was laughing by myself in my bedroom. Uh, and that was the whole idea. So basically, if you ever get caught for file sharing, you can just claim that you're a copimist, it's your religious service, and if they want to actually pursue that, it's four years in prison in Sweden for breaking your religious rights. Uh, but I must also, like, because we have some time, I'm going to tell a little weird story about this thing, because it's always fun to start things like, uh, like a church and so on. You should all try it. Uh, sometimes it goes a little bit too far. I was in, in Serbia, in Belgrade, at a conference um, together with one of the, the guys that uh, also started the church. Uh, and we were going to talk at like an internet freedom conference and, and there was a guy that came up to us um, just saying, hi, uh, I'm a copimist. And I'm like, okay, cool. Um, I, and I want to be the first person to get married in the copimist church. I'm like, uh, okay, I don't actually believe in marriage, but sure. Uh, whatever, and it's like, yeah, but I want you or Isaac to, to wed me and my, and my bride-to-be. We are both want to have like a copimist wedding, the first one ever. I'm like, okay. Uh, and it's like, okay, probably a joke. And I was t talking to this guy, I think he, they were Italian and Romanian, and they're a lovely couple, and they were asking, so uh, can you wed us? And like, I don't believe in marriage, I don't want to be part of this, you know, but sure, you can go and get married. Uh, ask Isaac, and Isaac, who's like, yeah, I'm not actually, I'm a Christian, so I don't believe in copimism, I ju I'm just a priest, you know, uh, it's kind of weird. Uh, so he was disappointed, this man, and then um, he asked me, so, but, but you are the guys behind the, the copimist church, so what would uh, you need for a wedding? And I just watched this, uh, what's it called, this Austin Powers movies a few days ago, so I said, lasers, you need lasers. <laughs> That's like a funny thing, you need lasers, every wedding should have lasers. And he's like, okay, write down lasers. Uh, and the day after, they actually had a wedding, and it was a guy from the pirate party who was the, the, the minister, and he was wearing, you know, this, this mask, you know, this uh, anonymous mask, uh, and he was, you know, trying to, he had some robot voice, text-to-speech kind of thing about the marriage things, and in the front row, there's like 20 people sitting with a laser pointer, and like going, eh, eh, and I think, it, and I realized, she, I, I actually started a cult, uh, so... <laughs> It was kind of fucked, <laughs> but it was funny. <laughs> so I think there's like 36,000 people in the church today, and it's a little bit, people have split. There's now an unorthodox and an orthodox copy his church. Um, and there's lots of, you know, internal fights and quarrels and, I asked this guy after the, the wedding, like, uh, if he didn't real realize that it's a joke, uh, the whole church. And, and he just looked at me and said, like, I think you're actually just testing my faith. <laughs> so, like, you can't really... And I'm pretty sure this is the way the Church of Scientology started as well. It's a joke, and like, oh, you didn't get it? Like, oh, you're testing me. You know? But for me, all of these things go in, like, hand in hand with the same values that I had, like, growing up as well. Like, I'm really scared of people with too much power. I'm really scared of, of like, people taking over, deciding over our freedoms and rights and so on. And for me, this has always, always been like the thing that I've noticed that going from the mega demo scene, like this, the, the freedom we had and the way we learned things, it's all been building up to this point where today, where a lot of people in here are really important in the internet sphere, in the technology scene. Uh, we have a lot of responsibility. We don't really look at it that way. And we just, you know, don't realize we're part of the problem that we're having with surveillance and so on. Uh, and crazy people like Trump winning. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit depressive clip. Uh, I think a lot of you have read 1984 by George Orwell, and I'm going to show you a little bit uh, from a documentary, kind of documentary about him. But he left one final warning. 1984 is, I believe, a quite terrifying masterpiece. So terrifying, in fact, I don't think I should like to read another like it. I'm not absolutely dissatisfied with it. I think it is a good idea, but the execution would have been better if I had not been under the influence of TB when I wrote it. You once claimed that you have an ability to face unpleasant facts. Is that what you've demonstrated in 1984 by drawing an accurate portrait of the future? I think that allowing for the book being, after all, a parody, 
something like 1984 could actually happen. This is the direction the world is going in at the present time. In our world, there will be no emotions except fear, rage, triumph and self-abasement. The sex instinct will be eradicated. We shall abolish the orgasm. There will be no loyalty except loyalty to the party. But always there will be the intoxication of power. Always, at every moment, there will be the thrill of victory, the sensation of trampling on an enemy who is helpless. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. The moral to be drawn from this dangerous nightmare situation is a simple one. Don't let it happen. It depends on you. So Orwell is really, really scared. That's not actually Orwell. This guy, this guy playing uh, Orwell. Um, and he's not right about everything. Like I think actually internet has done more for the orgasm than any technology before in history, <laughs> uh, to be honest. Uh, but it can replace some of the things he said, like the loyalty to the party. It's not loyalty to the party. It's loyalty to basically consumerism and loyalty to Facebook, maybe. We're all obsessed about all of these things, and we really don't really talk about them uh, as, uh, as problems in society. And for me, this is really, really scary. Because 1984 had this idea about uh, how the surveillance uh, society would look in the future, and we're so past what he actually thought was happening. And just a few days ago, there was a new uh, law proposal basically saying that um, in the UK, they want to have computers that give you fines and, and sentences for crimes. Instead of having a court, they just want a computer to calculate what kind of sentence you would have. So instead of this, you know, 1984 was not an instruction manual, maybe we should also go with minority report was not an instruction manual. Uh, and for me, this is really scary. And one of the reasons that I think it's important for people in technology to think about this is uh, a few years ago, there was uh, some companies here in Scandinavia that were doing quality of service applications for the internet because internet, okay, not a few years ago, maybe a decade ago, uh, I'm getting old, um, but there was not enough bandwidth in the fibers and so on. So they did quality of service hardware. Um, some of the hardware, you know, good idea for Scandinavia, um, but some of the hardware was later used in Libya by Gaddafi because, of course, that technology could be used to find people that are against your government. So we have this important role to play as well when we create technology that we also think about uses that we uh, that could have a bad effect on people because we're at that station. Uh, another thing is also like we always know how to prevent some of the issues that might happen to us. So technologists have an easy way to, you know, we understand how a VPN works, how Tor network works. We know how to change our DNS server so we don't get blocked uh, when we're trying to access, for instance, Pirate Bay, which I can brag saying it's the most censored website ever in history which is amazing. We're actually blocked in China for one reason. It's because freedom of speech, not because of copyright violations, uh, which is interesting. But just saying that you can, you can find technological ways to circumvent things is not good for the rest of society because we're building two different societies. We're building an elite society with technology understanding and we're also building the second one, which is for people that we should help to not end up in a situation like this. And it's not just about technology. It's what's going to be in the future as well. So when we started having the 3D printers discussions, people were like, yeah, but people are gonna make guns with 3D printers, so maybe we should limit the uses of 3D printers. And then again, you can go to Klaus Olsson and buy a knife or whatever. Uh, you, you can kill people easily with for 10 kronos, whatever, or like just having really big hands, you can also kill people. We can't really you know, put people with big hands in prison. Uh, but instead of like pre-fixing things that might be an issue, we should prefix so that things aren't limited in what we can do. Because rather than 3D printing stuff like, uh, you know, shitty skulls, we are going to 3D print food, we are going to 3D print uh, clothing and so on. I'd rather have a pair of shoes not made in Vietnam by some kid, just rather download it and print it at home and then reuse it when, when they're old, uh, which is probably going to happen in, in, in 10, 20 years. Uh, it's very likely. And if we already now start 
to you know make sure that we're not allowed to do that. If we have all of these laws in place preventing us from doing these things, that's not good for society. And for me, looking at this like historically, because my teacher in history taught me only one thing, uh, and that was to look at the future, you only look backwards in history, because we are going to repeat everything we did wrong, and we always believe that we're in, you know, this the time we're in right now is the most advanced time we can't grasp that what the future will hold. So this is like human progress. This is always, we're on the top of everything. But there's a difference with the technology right now because we're going to like some sort of hyper technologies where, because our computers are getting to the level where they can calculate things much faster. And we're doing rapid evolution rather than revolutions. So uh, some uh, researchers think that in 2035, we will invent more technology every month than ever before in history. Like every month we will double the amount of technology we have. And this will be very different for uh, because laws will not follow, human rights will not follow, all of these things. Uh, if you just look at the companies right, uh, right now um, that are the big companies, they don't do anything. They just negotiate between people. So Uber being the biggest taxi company, they basically have no cars. Facebook have basically no content. And then, you know, all of these sites like Airbnb is the biggest hotel chain in the world. They have no hotel rooms or anything. So we've been going from this idea of physical products to virtual products, and now we have virtually no products, which is the way you make money. And something is kind of off in this. Uh, and I was just going to complain about Slack because we had a discussion about Slack before. Slack is just commercial IRC. Skip that. Um, <laughs> so I'm really scared. Like, uh, a lot of you have probably heard that Pirate Bay has been censored in, in many countries on the DNS level. And, and for me, this like uh, interesting thought experiment. Maybe this will not happen. But anyhow, the, the same laws that they're passing on, that you can claim people's domain names, that you can stop a domain name from being used because something bad has happened using that domain name. Same thing could be applied in a physical world. So 10 years ago, people didn't think we could have self-driving cars. And then they were the most amazing self-driving cars they were better than normal drivers in just a few years. And next year, is, you know, we will have self-driving cars. We won't bother getting an actual car that will drive itself, because it, why should we? It's just stupid. In the end, we might actually outlaw driving cars, because they're going to be, you know, we as humans are worse drivers than computers. So what will happen? We will have some sort of map in the cars, right? And what if there's a crime happening in, you know, a square somewhere? Möllevangen in, in Malmö, excellent example. A lot of people sell, you know, stolen handbags or whatever, it's, it's shitty crime. But what if someone just decides, well, we can use this law against you know, domain censorship, we can use that law, and we can just impose that into the, you know, the, the, the maps you have in your car. So maybe you can't find this place, you can't actually go there in your car, because they just reused the same things that they've done before and we were okay with, because we didn't take internet seriously. How many people have heard about Henning Mankell? read his awful books, seen his awful video movies. So Henning Mankell is like, a, he, was, he was interesting in one way. There's only one thing I really liked with him. Uh, and that was, he had this discussion about like the, the, we're always, you know, we're talking about us being homo sapiens, but he actually think we evolved from that into homo narrans, as he called it. So we're, the difference is that we as humans, we can set narratives. And that is what's happening right now. Uh, Trump being an awesome example of like resetting the narrative. It's not about the truth anymore, it's about alternative facts. And that's a narrative, and we're doing this all the time. And that's what I'm playing, trying to play with, all, all, of the all of the things I'm doing. I'm doing a lot of artwork. Just explaining how stupid some things are and trying to change the narrative a little bit in, in, in the discourse in, in, uh, in society. Um, a year ago I made a, a small machine, which is one of my more famous artworks. Um, and it's called the copy machine, really spelled weirdly. And the only thing the copy machine does, it's a Raspberry Pi, which has a uh, really nice uh, uh, LED display. Um, and it takes one song that it has on the, on the memory card, and it makes a copy to dev null, and then just restarts. And this first line underneath the name of the machine is how many songs it's actually copied, so how many copies it's created. Um, and then the record industry have this idea that every song that has been copied uh, illegally, or in some way that they didn't make money from, they lose $1.25. So the second, third line here is how much money that record company has lost because of this. Uh, when I left home, thank you, 
So when I left home this morning, uh, I think it was something like $60 billion that this machine had destroyed from that industry. Of course, proving that this does nothing, copying does not affect uh, the value of things. So I just wanted to like, set people's narrative, like proving that it's, it's wrong. Um, I'm quite left-wing. Uh, and I've done a lot of weird projects that are kind of left-wing, but I also... I started one religion, but I also started a nationalist party here in Sweden. Uh, I'm starting it in Finland as well, just because it's, it's funny. Um, but it, it's, it's based on the Swedish Democrats, SD. So I wanted to show them that they're very wrong in how they think about like the, uh, who was here first and so on. So I started the Sama Democrats in Sweden. Um, basically reusing the, the Swedish Democrats' own party program but just including Swedish people as immigrants, because there were someone here before the Swedes. Uh, and this is also like a funny way to, to deal with the fact that um, you need, need to kind of show the narrative that it's wrong. The funny thing with the Summer Democrats is I was really serious when I said this. We made a huge website, everything, and it's like all of the policies are there. We copied some from the Swedish Democrats, some from the, the Nazi party, Svenskarnas Parti. We called ourselves Ur Svenskarnas Parti as well. Um, so it was kind of this funny. Also some quotes from Hitler, but who cares? It's kind of the same thing. Um, but the, the whole idea is that we sent in all of these new, uh, debate articles to newspapers saying like the Swedish people stole our land and so on, uh, just to make a debate about nationalism as a discussion in Sweden. And it ended up on one of the Nazi forums in Sweden discussing the Summer Democrats if we're serious or stupid. Um, and it kind of gets to the point where, uh, you know, a guy read the p uh, party program and he, he's a Nazi and he says, actually, they're right. I need to move back to Belgium where my great, 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 great grandfather came from. <laughs> I'm totally fine with that. Another guy was more, also very honest. He said, well, basically, uh, I don't care. They're like the Swedish version of Muslims. So who needs to listen to these Sami people? At least he's like more anti-Islam than the Nazi. But, but it was kind of, you know, kind of this thing. I am starting this in Finland just because there's a new there's a, a party in Finland called Peros Somalaiset, which means the indigenous Finnish, but I start Peros Samelaiset, which is indigenous Sami people. So just because of the name, you know, very Gothenburgish of me. Um, but all of these projects are, of course, mostly interesting because I'm really I really care about democracy. So for me, it's really important that we have democracy and that we actually cherish democracy because if you don't expand democracy you're limiting it. So if you don't expand your human rights, you're limiting your human rights in the end. So we need to do that all the time. So I'm half Finnish, half Norwegian, and uh, in, in Finland we actually put internet as a human right in, in our law, uh, which means that when we have all of these ACTA and FRA discussions, we couldn't implement some of the law proposals coming from the EU because it would violate human rights. None of the other countries in the EU did this, so we had a different discussion about this. Um, during the election in Denmark last time, it was, I think, two years ago, I took a screenshot from the most seen uh, programs on TV, I think it, half an hour before the election uh, ended. And for me, it was kind of interesting to see that the most seen TV show is not about the election. It's some comedy show that apparently must be very good. Very good. And the second most interesting thing was the Swedish royal wedding of the prince. So monarchy is more interesting than what ended up on the third place, the Danish election. Uh, for me, it's kind of um, a problem that we don't care more about democracy, that we don't think about this anymore. Um, and how many have been wanted by Interpol here? <laughs> Just random hands up. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I was for Pirate Bay, and, and I think not for the other things I've been involved with, yet, not yet at least. I was wanted by the Interpol uh, for a few years. Um, and I, I was thinking I need to do something about this to protect myself. Uh, and, and I was kind of also interested in making that into a discussion. So uh, I ran uh, in the European Union elections in Finland um, because I'm a Finnish citizen. And I was saying like, well, Swedish people put me on this Interpol most wanted list, which the whole idea was that we would be there until people kicked us out. It took 35 minutes until people got bored of us and kicked us out. But uh, that was my best ever compo uh, entry. No one remembers it except me. Okay. I do. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Great. Okay, so I think uh, there is some more time for the next event. Someone speaking after me. So I'll be around for the rest of the evening if you want to just talk memories or whatever. Uh, except DJ Cat because he, he remembers more than me. So I don't want to remember my own mistakes.
Great. Log. <laughs> hey. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, apparently the um, <laughs> machine completely died on me. That is not good, but I guess that's happened. That happens. Um,